Hello, everyone. Welcome to the IEEE CAS workshop. Don't forget to register, to register for free on our website in the description. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, and enjoy this workshop. Uh, now the session chair will introduce the speaker of the afternoon. Professor uh, Leonardo Soares, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, so continuing uh, the program of the ITRES IEEE uh, CAS workshop, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the presenter Jorge Castro Godinez. And uh, he is a doctor of engineering and is co currently an assistant professor at the School of Electronics Engineering in Costa Rica in the Institute of Technology. He was a scientist and he was a scientist and PhD student at the Chair for Embedded Systems in Karlsruhe Institute of Technology under the direction of Professor Dr. Jörg Henkel between 2015 and 2020. He received his five-year engineering degree and master in electronics engineering from the Costa Rica Institute of Technology in 2011 and 2014, respectively. Prior, he worked as embedded systems engineer at Canon Technology from 2010 to 2012. And he was also research assistant at the Sino and Image Processing Lab in the Institute of Technology of Costa Rica and uh, took part in an industry joint research and development project with Bounce Imaging from uh, 2012 uh, and 2014. Uh, his primary research interest is in energy efficient computing across the different abstraction layers with a particular interest on approximate computing and machine learning on edge computing. So, uh, thank you. In the, in the name of the organizing committee, I would like to thank you uh, uh, for accepting uh, to participate of this uh, uh, workshop. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Leonardo. It's it's a pleasure for me uh, to be part of the, of this uh, activity, and I'm I'm very thankful for for the invitation from, from Guilherme uh, to talk a little bit about this, this uh, very interesting research topic and to share a little bit uh, regarding what uh, also I have been working uh, about the topic. So thank you very much and I hope the, that the people will enjoy the talk and ask any questions regarding what I'm going to, to present. Good. Um, just a little bit about um, myself. Leonardo already shared a lot. I'm uh, starting here in Costa Rica as, a, as an assistant professor, so I'm trying to, to build my own research group. So it's an incipient uh, research group. I'm, I'm calling it this way, efficient computing across the stock, because I'm very interested in the different ways that uh, efficiency can be achieved in computing. And it's spanning across all, all the different layers where, where this can be done. And currently, I'm keeping uh, collaborations with my old research group in KIT in Germany, with the uh, University of uh, New York University in Abu Dhabi, also trying to establish some um, work with you guys uh, down there in, in Porto Alegre, and also with some people in the University of Texas in, in Dallas. And mainly focusing in, in this type of, of works regarding with design automation, low power design. Um, IoT and edge computing, as Leonardo mentioned, with all this emphasis in how to make uh, the efficiency or, or computing in, in an efficient way, this type of applications in edge computing. And keeping, of course, some um, eye in, in the evolution of the topic of approximate computing, uh, I will share a little bit about what I have been working, but uh, I'm trying to move, so to say, uh, at a higher level in the abstraction, moving into a cross-layer system level approximate computing approach. Um, that I will also, at the end, share a little bit of my uh, perspective regarding that. Just to put in context, because this is something that it's it's very common. So Costa Rica is not an island. So Costa Rica is here in Central America. So we're kind of connecting the big chunks of this uh, part of the atmosphere. Uh, and this is Puerto Rico, where, which is the island. So normally there is this confusion with, with people. I hope that for all our Latin American uh, colleagues, it's, it's not the case. But I, it's it's something funny that I always try to to bring just to make sure where where am I? 
Good. And just to tell a little bit about my university, it's the, it's the technical leading university here in Costa Rica. It's, I would say it's a young university. It's reaching the 50 anniversary uh, actually this year. And in the last decade, it's moving towards this sort of say change of the paradigm that has been historically a more focused uh, teaching university, so to say, um, but now uh, moving into the steps of, of doing more more research and being a more research oriented university. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And even though we are a very small country, uh, at least for instance, in comparison to, to Brazil, and we have just a population roughly reaching the 5 million people, um, there is a growing industry that has been, um, I will say, very pleased with the technical capabilities that uh, our engineers and, and the, the education that they're receiving mainly by the public universities. Uh, it's, it's attracting this type of, 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 of big companies. So we have an Intel facility here that, yes, back in the day, they start doing some manufacturing, but nowadays they do a lot of, of, of research and development here. We have divisions from Hewlett Packard, National Instruments, Emerson, Boston Scientific, and many, many more, even Microsoft doing very interesting things more into the software side. But I wanted to just point that, that even we are a small uh, dot, so to say, in, in the map, um, we have been able to, so to say, attract this type of, of investment, this, tri uh, this type of, of uh, companies because of the technical um, level that our people is reaching. So this is something that uh, also I'm proud of and I'm happy to, in a way, to collaborate in that sense from, from the university with, with the teaching and the research that we're trying to do. We're going to talk a little bit about approximate computing and, and how this uh, proposes a way to, to trade off um, the accuracy that we need for the computations in, in order to try to to, perf to gain savings and mainly uh, focusing in energy savings. But for me, it's interesting to also recall and, and talk a little bit how is that we get here to the point that we are trading accuracy for energy efficiency, power, or area efficiency. Well, one of the things uh, that I'm pretty sure you all know is that uh, a long time we have been, or the industry have been followed uh, Moore's law, which is an auto-predicted prophecy, so to say, and, and we know that what the industry has been trying to, 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 to pace in, in, in the way that they develop the, the microelectronic is to try to achieve this doubling uh, the amount of transistors every two years. Of course, this, this has many implications. And, and of course, by following this is that we have reached the point where we are. But not only Moore's Law is something that the industry has followed and that has allowed us to have these massive amount of transistors in, in processors uh, nowadays that span not just uh, high performance computing, but also considering uh, mobile devices like here's represented in this graph, like for instance, the, app, the Apple system on chips or even the high silicon keyring that the um, Huawei uh, utilizes in their, in their cell phones. So yes, we have been reaching this point and having um, this uh, uh, power in the term and in, in the consideration of computation power uh, performance due to this uh, insanely amount of transistors. Um, but of course, this also has some other uh, implications. We have also the NARC scaling that has been followed by the industry uh, that has, uh, in the, or in the past, tried to establish the way that we can keep scaling and increasing the number of transistors. But uh, the challenges that also arise with this is, is more related into the power density, and which means that we need to dissipate more heat. And Husam early in his talk, uh, Professor Ambrush talked a lot, a, a lot of this um, and how this is also a, a big challenge that we need to, to tackle. In response of all these uh, problems that we were not able to keep scaling uh, the way that uh, the NARC law uh, was proposing is that um, we have in the middle of 2000s, uh, this uh, switching to multi-car architectures in, in a way to respond to this problem. But even now that we have, uh, still a big amount of silicon available and we could put like many 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 cores into this uh, this term of problems that professor ambrush was talking about arise and then about 10 years or a little bit more uh, we start listening about this uh, utilization wall that we even we have like many uh, silicon available we are not able to use the silicon at the same time 
and because of these thermal and power issues that we are facing. So this is also part of this motivation into looking for uh, novel ways to do computations that can mitigate all these, these problems. And Professor Amruch talked in, in, uh, in his presentation about precision scaling, which is uh, at its core one way to, um, to move into this direction to try to mitigate this power and thermal um, barriers that we're facing uh, by trading the, the precision that we need. Uh, not necessarily or not only in the case of, of machine learning applications this is needed, and I will talk a little bit of that, um, but certainly is, an, is a way to try to tackle these, these problems that, that we have been um, uh, facing. But not only from the thermal and the power perspective, this is a challenge, uh, but also uh, in considering nowadays all the the informs that we are listening in the news that the uh, UN experts say, okay, we are reaching a point of no return in terms of, of the carbon emission and all the effect that we are doing into the environment. Um, it's important also to take it into account that the computation and the way that we do computation has a, an impact in that sense. And uh, I came across this, this article some, some time ago and, and really opened my eyes regarding this, this case that mentions one particular um, NLP application that just the uh, training of this application can consume even up to five times or can produce a, a, a carbon footprint similar to five times um, the carbon footprint that an average car uh, powered by fuel will produce in his lifetime. So this is very, very um, critical that we also pay into a, attention into this, how our computation is in a way uh, incrementing these environmental problems that we have. And, and not long ago, just a couple of months ago, also um, ARM came with some article uh, pointing a little bit about that, you know, uh, into the need that we have to this, decarbonize the computations that we do. And that in some way, nowadays, the new Moore's law, probably the, the one law that we need to follow uh, in the way that we do computing, it's trying to maximize the performance that we obtain per watt. Um, and I think this is this is very important to, to consider, very important to take into account and, and to be aware uh, why have been, uh, are, are we now in this point that we need to find uh, new ways to do computations due to the limitations, physical limitations, thermal limitations that we're reaching, but also the impact into the economics or into the, uh, the, the carbon footprint that our computation is, is reaching. This is one thing at one hand, and in the other hand, another thing I want to, to talk as a motivation is that in many scenarios, we don't necessarily have or can uh, afford to have a complete accurate computation. And this idea of best effort that has been also in the, in the community for about 15 years, is not something new. Um, by reading some book totally not related to technical part, I came across to this term called satisfying. Um, it turns out that it was more into the economics, uh, or com it comes from the economics field, and it was coined by Herbert Simon, which was a Nobel laureate. And it, it, in a nutshell, what he described is that not necessarily you have to get the very best option in whatever you're doing, um, but normally what you need is, is a good enough option. So you can imagine that you get into a bookstore and you have a huge amount of pens that you can select. Um, and you probably can come across with a, your own benchmark, so to say, to define what is going to be the best pen that you need. But at the end of the day, probably what you need is just something that writes good enough. Um, and then uh, facing this uh, this big scenario of possibilities is, is overwhelming. And then probably you just need to find a compromise and just make the choice that satisfies you. And which brings also the, the, the need to find this equilibrium between the effort that you need to pay, so to say, to pick what is going to be the pen that you, you, you want to buy and the benefit that you're going to obtain uh, from this pen. In a similar way, the way that we do computation needs to find this, this equilibrium, this effort that we need to pay in order to obtain the computations and the benefit that we will obtain. Normally, we heard uh, in, in different apps, aspects that the more that we do, the better it is. Uh, but not necessarily. Indeed, this also come across this uh, law of diminishing returns, 
which uh, in a nutshell what it says is investing more resources into a process not necessarily will improve its output in an indefinite way. And I took this, this graph from, from Wikipedia, but uh, represents uh, in, in a good way uh, what it means. Normally, uh, when we reach a maximum point of yield, a maximum point of performance, even if we keep adding resources to this process and thinking in, in the, from the way of, of computation, adding more computing resources, not necessarily will make a big change uh, into the result that we obtain. So we also have to take into consideration this, that probably we can reduce the resources that we apply and still obtain uh, a good enough output. Um, and this brings me in a way to, to this uh, phrase which is a little bit popular into the approximate computing community, that uh, it is better to be vaguely right than exactly wrong. So in that sense, uh, probably it's better to invest a little computation and still obtain uh, a very good enough uh, uh, solution and invest tons of uh, computing resources, uh, but doing it in a wrong way. So this power and energy uh, concerns uh, are inherently now in every uh, computing uh, paradigm and any computing uh, idea that we are looking at. Um, and these are driving forces, not only the, the, so to say, the old school performance that we were looking at, which is still is very important, but this concerns, this power and energy uh, uh, concerns limit actually uh, this part of the computation, this part of the performance that we can obtain. And on the other hand, uh, there are many applications, many workloads that can have or can experience some error tolerance uh, into their computations. Um, and this is how, in a way, approximate computing consolidates into the research community as a novel energy efficient design paradigm for error tolerant applications. I would say that this idea of using approximations is, is not new. It's what we experience, uh, for instance, with uh, even with floating point computations, that it's something uh, well known and well established. But even though uh, having, let's say, a 32-bit uh, uh, representation for falling point, we are still, in a way, uh, approximating some values that could have more significant uh, uh, numbers after the, the, the floating point. Um, just to bring it in, in, into the consideration that this is not something new. And in many cases, uh, and I see it, for instance, from, from the video game perspective, we have been uh, okay with the graphics that we have been able to get because there were the, the, the computing resources that we that we have. But now we have more computing resources. Now we expect, so to say, more uh, graphics quality, for instance. What is the idea in a nutshell of approximate computing? So we have into a balance uh, the quality that we expect from the computations and the effort that we need to pay uh, to actually do the computation. So we want to reduce in a controlled manner, the accuracy of the results in order to then reduce the effort that we need to pay, the execution time, the circuit area, the power or the energy. And in a way, and this is just to motivate, we can consider, well, we are doing some image processing. And of course, if we reduce the quality of our computations and allow, in this case, more errors that we can experience here as, as noise in the image, uh, the idea is that we can then probably have more savings uh, in any of these uh, different aspects that we that we can consider, depending, of course, of the of the implementation that we have in uh, in mind. But in a nutshell, this is this is the idea that we uh, try to chase with approximate computing. And I was mentioning that this is very important because we have a good amount of applications that present this inherent uh, inherent error uh, tolerance, and for many many reasons. For instance, because the actual inputs are noisy. We do use probably redundant information. Even probably this, the, the, the algorithm itself produces some, some healing or some iterative process internally that can, uh, so to say, cope with this type of errors. Or just because there is no actual golden output. This is, for instance, the case of machine learning applications, where, for instance, in classification applications, we get this percentage of the probability of uh, that, for instance, the image that we are putting into our, our deep neural network is, is one type over another. And in many cases, and, and this is, for instance, the case of, of, of much processing computer visions, there are perceptual limitations that our naked eye cannot 
distinguish up to certain threshold the amount of noise in, in an image. And, and it's particularly important that in uh, applications like, like this, that like goes from document research to uh, eye detection, image segmentation, and so on, then the amount, the percentage of the application that represent an error tolerant part is significantly big. Uh, in many cases, because there are some specific kernels that are dominant into the application. And these kernels present uh, exactly this, this type of behavior that they can be uh, error tolerant, that we can introduce on purpose uh, inaccurate computations and then uh, reduce uh, the resources that we need. So from the proximate computing, there is, of course, many, many questions uh, related to how uh, can we utilize uh, this type of techniques. And I will mention some of the different techniques that have been proposed across uh, across the stack. But of course, this is, this is some question that always uh, pops up. And I always receive this type of questions, like how much can I relax my computations? How much is a good enough answer? And one of the challenges is that the proximate computing presents is that it's very uh, tight, or the level of approximations or the type of, of techniques that we can uh, apply, it's very tight to the type of application and the actual, um, let's say, consumer, user, or final implementation requirements to define, okay, how much can I relax my computations and I still produce an answer that it's good enough. And as I say, it depends on the application, depends on the final accuracy requirements, and something that it's very important to take into account is uh, it's my critical section, the critical section of my application ever tolerant. And normally we heard about this 80-20 rule, 90-10 rule, that normally an 80%, 90% of the execution time of, of many applications is consumed just by a small percentage of the actual code, for instance. So we need to look at, um, well, is, is this hotspot into the application ever tolerant? And can I introduce approximations to then profit uh, as much as possible of, of this relaxation, of this re reduce and the precision, and then profit from, from, um, from the savings that I can accordingly uh, achieve? Can I support or, or do I need to just have uh, errors that are deterministic that I know that for the same input data, I will achieve the same errors, or can I tolerate non-deterministic errors? Um, what I am trying to achieve is an, an energy reduction. Reduction. I'm trying to re reduce the, the runtime, or uh, is it some data density involved and I need to reduce uh, memory transactions, for instance? So there are many, many different vectors that need to take uh, into consideration. Uh, but in most of the cases, if not almost in all, uh, regarding the approximate computing techniques that have been reported in the literature, is that the techniques are applied in the way that the data is processed, but not necessarily in the control flow. So we don't want to change, in most of the cases, as I say, um, the way that the actual flow of the computation is performed, but we want to uh, have some impact uh, in the way that we process the data and then have the chance in that process to introduce these uh, inaccuracies into the computation to then profit and get some, some savings. Uh, and in many cases, it will be required from a high level perspective that we identify into our application which parts are actually uh, resilient to this type of errors, uh, where others will be uh, sensitive to then know in which parts we can introduce the different techniques according to the different abstraction layers or depending on the our final implementation, if it's something at a, at a software level or hardware level, uh, level will define or will open the door to different techniques that can be applied. But this is, uh, this is something very important to, to have in mind that uh, not all parts and applications will be tolerant to errors and that we need to uh, identify which of these sections of the applications are actually ever tolerant to then define the techniques that can be applied uh, into the application. And as I was mentioning, um, and this is, at least from my perspective, I find pretty exciting, is that at the different layers of the computed, computing stack, and probably you are very um, aware of this type of, or, or this classifications of the different stacks in the computing, um, 
different techniques have been proposed. And, and this is very interesting because depending on the level or, or our final implementation or where we already have our application, we can look at to see what type of techniques can be applied uh, in order to, to achieve savings. And of course, at the different levels, we can uh, set different questions to, to find, okay, how can we do, uh, for instance, approximations at a, the electrons level, the circuit level, uh, hack, uh, what, what granularity can we introduce approximations at the architecture? Or how, how can we, at the instruction set architecture level, define approximations and so on, moving up, uh, up to the algorithm level to define how we can, for instance, can tweak and change our, alg our algorithm and still produce good enough results, but then achieving some savings by, by introducing these approximations in the way that normally the algorithm is produced. And, and different ways, different means of utilization and different means of appro uh, uh, approximations have been defined uh, in the community. I want to go for, for different levels and try to, to highlight uh, at the different levels uh, of this computing stack some contributions that I have done in, in the past years. And at the end, I want to share a little bit of, of my perspective of what is, uh, at least what I see, it's going to be the future uh, into com uh, approximate computing, uh, more particularly in the way that we can uh, interact and introduce uh, uh, different uh, techniques at the different abstraction levels uh, in order to maximize the savings that we can achieve, achieve and not only applying one of the techniques at one of the computing or, or, or the abstraction layers. And thinking about electrons and, and at the end, and, and we know that what we do in, in, in terms of computing is just orchestrating electrons in a way to to do certain type of work and then produce at the end certain type of computations. But one way that we can sort of say tweak uh, at this level uh, of abstraction is decreasing the voltage um, beyond the, the circuit limits. And, and or in this case, introducing some, some timing um, effects uh, while keeping in this case, the frequency the same. So the idea in this case is if I move into um, circ essential circuits like, uh, like adders, uh, many of or most of the of the computations can finalize in less um, less time of the critical path. So normally, just the most significant bits will be stressing, so to say, this uh, this critical path, and then, for instance, voltage can be reduced. Try to obtain savings. Try to um, so to say cope to the way that these computations, the ones in the less significant bits. Uh, finalize, but of course, having certain dropbacks that if we apply this type of techniques um, and we affect the most critical paths, well, these uh, errors could be, uh, or could present a higher significance. Um, and of course, this is input depend and this can be uh, very dramatic if our information is, is located actually in the most significant bits. But one of the ideas here is if we can tweak the voltage that we are applying to our circuit, then we can reduce uh, significantly the dynamic power. And this has been uh, applied, this is some work that has been reported in the literature um, to different cases. And what it's interesting to see is it applied to different adders, for instance, to ripple carry adders and so on. Uh, we can experience certain error probabilities, uh, but in, in some cases, and, and considering for instance, the less significant part um, can even be error free in, in some of the cases for different uh, factors of voltage uh, overscaling. Of course, this behaves differently for different architectures of adders. Um, but what is interesting to see is even by, by doing this, as I say, this tweak into, into the voltage and reducing the amount of voltage, uh, we can hit some savings and we can, of course, compromise the accuracy, not necessarily going into this level with the, uh, the error probabilities, it's even higher. But according to the application, keeping it to a level where still the outputs can be or can satisfy the, the, the results that, that you need or can have the errors that you can tolerate. Uh, but this is just to put in, into context that even into this uh, bottom layer, so to say, in the computing stack, we can have this type of approximations. One that has been uh, insanely uh, highly uh, work in the community is at the approximate functional level. So many approximate arithmetic circuits, circuits, mainly adders and multipliers have been uh, proposed 
Uh, when I was writing my dissertation, I made a, a quick search in Scopus, and about 35% of all uh, approximate computing papers reported there in, in Scopus, Scopus or in that set there were related to adders and multipliers, to approximate version of adders and multipliers. So the community has to spend a lot of effort and time into, into this part. And just to bring in uh, as, as illustration, mainly the two type of, uh, types of approximate functional adders, in this case that have been proposed, are focused either in reducing the precision of the lower part of the computation, so affecting the less significant bits. And in this case, it's by performing a, an architectural change, so to say, in the, in the regular way that we do the computation. And in this case, considering that we have as a ripple carry adder, um, something very, very traditional, very well known. And, and on the other hand, um, something called more into a high performance adders, uh, approximate adders, where the addition itself is just cut into smaller um, additions that are still accurate and normally are overlapping, um, that, in, uh, that ideally will perform faster as, as the critical path is shorter in this case. These two types of approximate adder present different error profiles here represented as a probability mass function, and, and of course different compromises and different savings um, that we can expect. So for instance, in this case, probably we're paying a little bit more of, of area trying to achieve um, a faster adder, where here probably, in this case, well, yes, we, we reduce the delay, but significantly reduce, for instance, the, the power in the area by simplifying the way that the full adder uh, we're computing and just replacing by an OR gate. But this is just to mention that, well, the community has spent a lot of time and effort into this. And it makes sense because many uh, computations, so if we go, for instance, from the machine learning perspective, most of the computations that we care about are Mac operations, so it's multiplications and additions. But in many um, uh, applications from the image processing domain, we see that about 75 and above percent of the computations are mainly additions and multiplications. So, of course, this makes sense that we can, uh, or that, that we pay attention to this type of applications like Sovel, Gaussian filter, Sharpe and Laplace filter, and so on. And the reason that the community has spent time to, to propose this type of approximate components. Um, and it's interesting that still, I mean, from many of those that have been proposed in the community, we just can uh, still uh, keep adding uh, into the list uh, many different um, components, approximate ones, by just, for instance, proposing a different way to perform uh, the addition, to, pro to provide the, the, the summation bit or the carry out bit. And this has been taken into account, for instance, in having some designs where we can just replace from this plethora of different approximate components, those that are normally accurate ones. And in this case, from a SED um, computation, just considering, for instance, a replacement of all these adders and performing uh, an, an exploitation of the design space to then find those that are uh, into a Pareto optimal uh, frontier. Um, so this, of course, is it's, it's what in the community has been proposed. Uh, performing this type of explorations, of course, is it's very um, exhaustive. Uh, but consider, for instance, a, a long list of different components that in the community have been proposed. And even for a, a very simple design, I will say, because it's, it's, it's not that complex in terms of the computations, we can explore the different scenarios to, that it's possible to achieve by introducing approximations. At this level, and not just uh, by proposing approximate components, um, that by nature, I mean, are modifying the architecture that, that traditionally it's been used, the community has looked uh, also a, a lot into how to perform an, an logic synthesis that introduces approximation. So the idea is to generate approximate circuits from accurate implementations, mainly performing a traditional accurate synthesis. So generating from our RTL description, uh, an accurate net list representation, and then introducing um, approximations into this representation. So, Basically, it's performing a, a functional simplification, trying to make it simpler, either at this level, the netlist transformation, some other have proposed uh, some Boolean rewriting, so changing the, the Boolean representation um, and rewriting itself, the, 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 so to say, the RTL that we are um, taking as, a, as an input, and then having a synthesis 
which is accurate, uh, accurate or even moving a little bit um, higher into the uh, abstraction uh, by using high-level synthesis in an approximate way, which I'm going to talk a little bit later on. So back in the day, I was looking at this, uh, trying to see what it was missing, uh, because there are many techniques that have been proposed in the, in the community regarding approximate logic synthesis, but we were facing a challenge where there is or there were no open source framework where we can apply this type of net, netlist transformation based techniques to then have some exploration and see what we could um, contribute in that sense. So we were looking at that and decide to uh, propose a small uh, tool, so to say, to try to apply this type of, um, of techniques already reported and existing in, in the community uh, to see if we were able to propose any other uh, technique. So we came across this um, this tool that we call uh, we call AXLS. Um, first, we get a netlist generation, very traditional uh, to what we do uh, in an ASIC flow. But we define uh, a custom netlist uh, representation, in this case based in AXML, uh, to perform then the transformations that were defined by the different techniques. So basically, we get something that looks like this, and what it represents is a, a, a type of representation, in this case, uh, as a uh, direct cycle graph um, from the netlist uh, description. But this XML representation provide us, so to say, a flexible way to perform transformation to, for instance, perform some gate pruning and rewire um, the netlist, and, and then generate uh, an approximate netlist from this transformation that later on can be, of course, passed to uh, further to the synthesis tool to get whatever sequence metrics that you are uh, interested in. Um, but of course, in this process, and this is something that we uh, saw in many of the of the techniques that they are, uh, as they are reported, they consider exhaustive simulations in the loop uh, just to consider that any transformation that is applied uh, is still uh, meets an error uh, or an accuracy threshold that is defined. So just to make a, a, an illustration, so by applying this into a, a netlist representation that is accurate, um, so we were able to say to define, okay, yes, this is our, these are the, the knots that we need to prune according to, as I say, the technique that is reported and, and then generate an approximate netlist. And we did some small um, evaluation with two different uh, techniques, one based in probability pruning, uh, some other considering some uh, exploration from the input uh, to the outputs and defining what was able to, to transform. But the takeaway from this is that now we have a tool that we can uh, implement techniques, that we can look at these techniques and see what else we can apply. But something that was very interesting in, in the process and that we are looking at is how we can sort of say take away as much as possible this simulation step by looking at the netlist, looking at the transformations that are applied and using machine learning based uh, methods, perform um, a first estimation of the error degradation, how this transformation of the netlist is producing errors and these errors are represented uh, into the output. Um, and this is something that we are um, actively looking at. So with this too, I try to cover some of the techniques about the electron side, or the electron layer or the circuit layer. And I want to talk some into the micro architecture level. So one of the, of the things that uh, the community has also uh, been looking at is to approximate accelerators. So normally we know that an accelerator can be just a piece of hardware that we use to sort of say offload some uh, hotspots, some frequently executed part of a code. So that's what we do, for instance, uh, when we use uh, some general purpose uh, GPUs or some specific DSP that might be available into, into a system on chip. But from the approximate computing perspective, the idea is to then generate an accelerator that of course is going to execute some frequently par, frequently executed part of a, an application, but it, that is also error tolerant. So the idea is that then we can exploit also uh, approximations at that level. Of course, there is a research challenge associated. And especially when we look to this plethora of different approximate components that has been reported in the literature. And it's if we get an application and we get a set of components, then how can we perform, so to say, the selection of those components to build our circuit, to build our accelerator that will minimize the computation effort that we have, uh, but at the 
and also will satisfy a defined accuracy. So we can look at this in, in, in a diagram in that way. So um, we get a lot of components coming in uh, and we expect approximate accelerators going out, um, but any of this uh, approximate accelerator will be designed accordingly to the error tolerant application and the constraints uh, that the process uh, uh, receive. And particularly the way that we have been looking at is how to do this process, because you can do it, of course, manually, uh, but how to do it in an automated way. So for doing it, uh, we found uh, one challenge. The first one was, okay, how can we estimate um, the accuracy when we use approximate components? A little bit like similar to this, uh, from, from this NetList representation that I was commenting uh, before. But in this case, if we have, for instance, one of the, of the solid kernels uh, and we replace the addition with approximate ones, then the question is, what is the error of the output? Well, normally the process is you implement your circuit and you go for simulations and then you answer the question. But of course, in a process that explore, uh, explores a very uh, high, uh, highly dense uh, a scenario of pos a possible solutions, um, this, is, this is a bottleneck. So we look uh, at different methods, at different ways to estimate, and this is one of contributions that we have, uh, how the errors produced by these approximate components not only interact uh, with all the approximations introduced by another approximate component, but how also interact with other uh, accurate uh, operations uh, that are, so to say, beyond the, the, the point where the errors are introduced. Uh, we came across to some rules that we can apply, and uh, the evaluation of these rules show that, of course, the estimations that we do here at the left are not 100% accurate to those that we have as or that, that we can obtain uh, with simulations here represented by these uh, ever probability uh, ever uh, distributions as a PMF as a probability mass function but we can get very uh, good enough estimations also in this case to um, to be used uh, or as, as a guide in the process of the, uh, the exploration of the design space. Another very important component in, in that process uh, that, that we look at is, okay, if we are doing a lot of um, evaluations considering different scenarios, different components, um, can we also reduce uh, the, the need or the exhaustive need of performing every time that we consider a new solution um, synthesis to then get metrics and see if actually we are reducing or not the, uh, the resources that we need. So we look at that and also propose some models that are still are also not 100% accurate. And, and this reminds me one, one quote, very, very funny, but it's very true that uh, all the models are run, but some are useful. And in this case, these models that we came out uh, turned turn out to be useful enough to help us also in this process that by replacing approximate components to get a first uh, impression of what is the impact uh, on the different, um, in this case, circuit parameters from area to dynamic and, and static power and to delay. And by considering these two components, uh, the accuracy estimation for one side, the resource estimations from the other, um, we came across to some design space exploration uh, using this type of analytical model. So we take a behavioral description of the application of what we wanted to map into an accelerator uh, produce uh, a data flow graph, and from this data flow graph to produce uh, an exploration for a given ever threshold perform an accuracy estimation and a resource estimation as well. And then for a given approximate library, so a, a, a set of approximate components, mainly adders and multipliers because of the motivation I present early, um, then have an optimization solver to produce an approximate representation of this uh, DFG. Um, we did it, as I mentioned, taking as an input C code, um, extracting from an intermediate representation um, the structure of, of, the, of the circuit, so to say, and from this DFG to perform this type of, of exploration. We took this exploration in, in, in the first approach by using some table search and defining some fitness um, e equation. We put this into uh, an automated way to perform the exploration. Uh, the first thing that we saw is that this design space exploration was performing good enough and helping us to find also the solutions that were in the Pareto front 
uh, for, of course, a given set of approximate components. Uh, and for defining one uh, or in a specific accuracy threshold uh, to be able to find those that were um, satisfying in this case, uh, not only the, the accuracy requirement, but also lowering the resources as much as possible. And we saw that, of course, our solutions were not 100% uh, uh, accurate, so to say, with an exhaustive exploration, but in 90% of the cases, roughly estimating, uh, we were uh, achieving the Pareto optimal solutions by this design space exploration. And as I mentioned, we took this design exploration that we um, that we worked and we put it into an, a high level synthesis flow. As I was mentioning, this is also one of the ways uh, from the logic perspective or from the synthesis perspective, uh, sorry, um, how to introduce this type of approximations um, into the scene. And in this way, what we did is just to hack basically one um, open source tool, uh, in this case, leg up uh, for high level synthesis and introduce or approximate um, uh, or the approximations in this case by these design space exploration that was able to introduce approximate components uh, into the design. Of course, further stages into the sort of say canonical process of the high level synthesis needed to be modified in order to pass information regarding the approximations, but at the end, in the R, at the RTL uh, generation, take these approximate components that were used in the design space exploration and then generate uh, an approximate uh, version of the, of, the, of the accelerator, and in this case, at the RTL level. And um, some results that we obtained and that we were able to, to look at is that even for a small degradation, uh, in this case, considering an accuracy metric called mean error distance of just five, we were able to lower uh, up to 30% energy requirements. So this is something that shows that even for simple um, changes in, into the design, of course, performing the exploration in a faster way than uh, it will be by just using um, the traditional method with simulations and, and synthesis uh, um, all the time that we were exploring a different case, um, we were able to, uh, in a fast way, as I say, obtain um, approximate results uh, that we were uh, reducing significantly the energy. Of course, and our tool was open to then define different accuracy constraints and then produce, so to say, the accelerator that was, in this case, minimizing the energy consumption uh, for that case of that accuracy. And of course, as we were reducing accuracy, we were uh, achieving uh, higher savings, uh, in this case of, of energy represented as a power delay product, but of course this has an impact uh, into the accuracy that we achieve. Um, which of the solutions is, is the one that I will pick? As I mentioned early, uh, it will depend on the application requirements, uh, how much degradation can you tolerate? And, and in some cases, and this is very important, or in many cases actually, and, and ours was not uh, one uh, out of the case, we were targeting for accuracy metrics that has an impact, of course, into a quality metric. So in this case, so to say, the impact and the quality is, is a byproduct of, of the definition of what accuracy we were targeting. Um, but this is something that is also very important to look at, that in many cases, we need to look at the other way around and by defining an accuracy, a, a quality metric, because normally it's, it's what we expect from the application as an output, we can, so to say, draw back um, the degradations that we can apply to then define, for instance, what is going to be the accuracy that we need to target uh, into our design. Um, this uh, or that was one work that we has had been looking, sort of say, into this microarchitecture level, how to use uh, approximate accelerators and how to design them. Uh, but recently, uh, some different works has has been uh, or still proposed, and recently this one. Uh, at least got my attention uh, because it was a very interesting one in which uh, value similarity, which is uh, one particular case in many applications that they present similar values and by having similar values and we can skip computations and then just reuse um, previous, uh, previously calculated results. Um, so they propose, for instance, to modify and, in, and extend the instruction set architecture um, to then have this, this possibility to monitor, 
the information that's being processed and then the, decide just to skip some computations according to some uh, similarity. Of course, it's, it's not 100% um, equal uh, values that are uh, being calculated, but similar. And then, of course, you expect that the results uh, for similar computations, similar operations uh, will be the same. So it's a very interesting way to, to also come into this abstraction level and introduce different techniques of approximations. Um, what it was interesting to me at this was, were the, the, the speed up numbers that they were achieving uh, for a very low degradation uh, into the classification uh, that they were achieving because they were applying this to, to machine learning uh, applications. So as I mentioned earlier, at different level of abstraction, different works have been proposed. Um, in some cases, for instance, and this is very important, and Professor Amruch mentioned it early, approximations have been applied to neural networks to, for instance, as, as, as pruning of the precision, just to make it lighter, uh, the, the, the execution. But also, uh, from the other way around, neural networks have been used to replace our tolerance sections, trying to exploit the actual uh, in, in, in exact nature of, of neural networks. So works have been also proposed to take some code, map it to a neural network, and implement this neural network as an accelerator. So for instance, taking some solver code, performing some training and de defining some topology, and then just performing the replacement, so to say, not executing by code, also having then an, an accelerator, but this accelerator being designed particularly or inspired in this case by, by a neural network. And, and the works reported in the literature mentioned how they couple this and how they design this neural processing unit, how they configure, but how they exploit, and this is what it's interesting, this, this idea of applying or using a neural network for approximations, where the most things that we see nowadays, it's how we apply approximations to the actual neural networks. Uh, and very interesting speed up and, and energy savings are, are also reported in that sense even achieving um, application speed ups uh, up to 30, which is uh, significantly important for some applications where in some others, of course, uh, it's more uh, modest, the, the, the savings achieved. But also, and this is something uh, very important and, and Professor Amrish men mentioned earlier in, in his talk, we already have some specific uh, computing circuits already designed and already commercialized um, to perform um, this type of deep learning applications or network applications in an ASIC. Uh, and many, many techniques have been uh, proposed and, and introduced to this type of applications, as mentioned, quantization and pruning. But in the case of an actual chip, uh, we are reduced a little bit in, into the possibilities that we have to introduce approximations. So this is a small case study that, uh, that we did, a master student of mine and, and myself, uh, using the Movidius Myriad X, these this platforms from, from this Movidio company of Intel, um, and trying to exploit what type of approximations, in this case limited to the software level, can we apply to a steel uh, gain from the uh, inherent error tolerance, tolerant nature of these type of applications when using this combination, a uh, Raspberry Pi connected to, to this uh, score. And something that we saw particularly for these uh, for these scene classification application is that yes, from a baseline perspective, um, it was achieving up to twenty percent improvement. Just taking the application, not running it at, uh, using TensorFlow into the Raspberry Pi, but just moving and using the the accelerator. So we were just by doing that achieving a, a 20x improvement but by using a combination of different techniques and that's what we were exploring here uh, we were able to increase uh, this performance and measure as, as inference per second and 20x more or a little bit more um, so still by using this type of applications or this type of implementation that we could consider a little bit fixed that we can or the, the, the degrees of freedom that we have to apply approximations is it's well reduced just to the software, still we can get um, very interesting numbers. Uh, and what was also interesting for us is that from the baseline um, accuracy that we were achieving, but even performing these uh, transformations and these um, approximations, we were able to increase a little bit, a couple of percentage uh, points, uh, the, the, the uh, the accuracy of the of what we were using, uh, and as I mentioned, increasing significantly the performance that we were achieving. 
And moving for, uh, further into the abstraction level, software techniques have been proposed, mainly loop transformations uh, that have been extensively studied in the community. Uh, more recently, some other techniques also considering the value similarity have been exploited, for instance, to, to, to perform um, uh, replacements or uh, from variables to variables to present similar values or by performing also some stati statistical analysis for one application and one particular input data um, to see, well, what it's going to be uh, the replacement that I can do. Can I change this variable for a fixed value for a constant and then reduce also the amount of computations that I need to do? And uh, at least in my case, I have a small, a small study at looking also at this combination of, uh, well, there is some pixel correlation and many uh, in mixed, of course, total sense. And in images, we have a lot of uh, correlation in terms of the values of pixel that are close by. And by applying this and performing some variable to variable replacement and applying also some loop perforation to look at the savings that we still at the software level can achieve. Uh, so very interestingly, by, by applying um, or by doing some combination of techniques, which was, for instance, uh, this case here, uh, by applying loop perforation and by applying some uh, var one variable to variable transformation, uh, we were able to reduce, for instance, the, the execution time to a half and still maintain higher um, quality numbers, uh, depending, of course, on, on the metric. But from the SSMI perspective or the, from the PSNR, still producing images with errors that normally to the naked eye are not perceptible, but are still reducing, as I mentioned, the, 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 the execution time here normalized uh, about, the, about the half uh, of the original one. And there are many, many, many more techniques um, that go also up into this abstraction level, uh, applying minimization, uh, reusing then values that have been pre-calculated, uh, considering, uh, multi-thread uh, applications, for instance, re relaxing the synchronization, performing data type replacements, high performance communities looking a lot into the this techniques, or also in the high performance community, but probably where we can afford to have custom hardware, looking at non-conventional floating point formats that can provide also uh, a good enough accuracy for specific applications where, so to say, the dynamic range of the information is well known and, and we can reduce the representation. And this is also what has been uh, performed in the community and in the industry with the newer platforms, for instance, from NVIDIA, that now they, they support uh, operations down to the level of 8-bit integers and showing, uh, as Professor Amrush mentioned in, in, in his talk, um, that even by moving from 64, 32, um, a bit uh, floating point representations to this 8-bit representation, still uh, good results are being achieved by these type of platforms and for a lot of um, deep learning applications. So I don't want to cover too much about that, but I want to probably share with you what it's the, the vision that I have or the perspective I see uh, for further uh, um, into the approximate computing. One that I was mentioning is, is this gap that is uh, between accuracy and quality. I, I recognize myself that I have been working more towards an accuracy constraint and using the quality as a byproduct. But what is accuracy? What is quality needs to be redefined? And, and especially this particular case that we need to design for a, a particular quality and then draw back uh, what is going to be the accuracy requirements that we need. One that I find that is very interesting is, is this cross-layer conceptualization and how we can um, apply approximate computing, not just to one level, just to one part, but to different ones. For instance, not just into an approximate accelerator, but considering approximations at the software, the memory, or at the bus. And recent work, it's, it's looking uh, towards this, applying different approximations at different levels and trying to find what is going to be the, the best match, so to say, of the different techniques that, that are applying at the different levels, at the different components, different parts, and, and find, so to say, what is going to be the merge approximation that will produce higher savings. So I think this is something that is very important. Something that is missing in this process is how to model the errors that are being propagated through the different stages, through the different uh, layers, and this is something that I'm very interested to look at.
And the other one is that we need to look at, uh, at the application level and try to design quality-driven um, implementations, but into an end-to-end -end consideration. So an application, a specific metric, it's needed to guide the overall design. And in this sense, uh, there are also some works, probably I'm going to show this, uh, where an approximate inference system is it's proposed, but different techniques are applied at different stages of the processing of the information. And, and this is also something that we that we need to look at, not just, as I mentioned, to one layer, but also to the different stages um, and trying to uh, use uh, quality constraints to guide uh, this process. So I really uh, appreciate the time. Um, sorry if I was talking a little bit fast at the end, but I wanted to uh, meet the time. Um, but I think approximate computing, it's, it's reaching um, uh, some level uh, in the community. Still, there is a road ahead to make it a more, um, or, or to bring it really to the mainstream of, of the design uh, in, in the many different computing systems, and especially in the industry. But I think um, the work that has been done, it's, it's, it's very exciting, and it's very promising the different venues, the different uh, opportunities uh, to look forward into this topic. And once again, I, I thank for the invitation. And for me, it's a pleasure uh, to have this opportunity to, to share with you about this, this uh, very exciting topic. Thank you, Professor Castro Godinez, for this excellent talk. Uh, now, the audience, do you have uh, any question? Uh, meanwhile, I uh, would like to, to ask a question. Uh, specifically about, uh, uh, we have uh, great opportunities uh, to explore uh, approximate computing, even considering the emerging applications, uh, like uh, uh, applications uh, related to uh, Internet of Things. And uh, we have lots of work and findings uh, showing uh, the benefits of using uh, approximate computing. Uh, I would like uh, that you explain your opinion about uh, uh, the big challenges you bring to us uh, in the, the, the last slide uh, and uh, explain uh, how to uh, bring a, a bridge, how to bridge the, the gap between the, the cross-layer uh, uh, accuracy and quality estimations specifically. Uh, because uh, uh, how to bring this together and 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 uh, convey this in the product, for example. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, I will say, well, I, I don't have a definite uh, answer. I, I, this is actually one one of the questions I'm looking at currently, uh, because at least by by keeping the sort of say the approximations at a single layer. Um, I mean, there, are, there is already work reported how to do it. I mean, if you're doing something at the, at the circuit level, there are different uh, propositions how to perform these error estimations. Um, me, myself, I have proposed something. There are some other contributions. Also, from, from the software perspective, uh, not long ago, I learned from, from the high-performance community also how they perform this by, by changing, so to say, the format or, or the precision that they were using, how they, so to say, take this back to perform an analysis and define, okay, these approximations or, or this, in this case, precision scaling that we are doing um, is still producing good enough resources. But this is still, as I mentioned, uh, remaining into a single layer. Um, moving cross layer, this is something that we need to still look at. Um, I'm not quite sure what is gonna be the, the solution by now, what, people is doing, and in this case, I was sharing a little bit of this, that it's work from uh, uh, Professor uh, Benjamin Carrion Schaefer in, in University of Texas and his group. It, it's something that they are, are also not, not yet quite there. I mean, most of what they do is to perform simulations, to run the system, um, and then see if the approximation that they are applying and, and the combination of such approximations is it still meeting any any maximum error that they can tolerate? Um, so these at this point still cross layer is focusing into um, simulations uh, at any of the levels that can be performed. Probably uh, still from the C uh, perspective in this case that they use high level synthesis to 
so to say, to generate uh, all of these components that later on are approximated. So this is also the philosophy that they follow. Um, but the errors estimations are still uh, remaining, so to say, to a single layer. And then let's see how they behave. Um, this is something I, I'm looking at, as I mentioned, trying to see if there is possible in a way to abstract the way that each of the layers is contributing to an accuracy degradation or to a quality degradation, looking at the, at the actual accuracy or, or quality output requirements that you have. And to see if it's possible, so to say, to make a, a backwards map, so to say. And, and this is very important because it's something that it's uh, possible to explore here and has been explored into the circuit level with generating, so to say, approximate accelerators, is that you can have, uh, so to say, a path producing certain errors that can be compensated by another path producing errors with similar magnitude but, but opposite, so to say, uh, sign and then that at the end you can compensate this type of errors. So this is something also that by having this type of estimations at a cross layer uh, perspective, we can see if we, for instance, can introduce some uh, sorry some approximations. For instance, um, at, a, at a hardware level, at a, uh, in this case, at some accelerator level, that then can be compensated by the approximations that we can introduce at CPU. So then we can go more aggressive in terms of the approximations knowing that we can compensate and then meet uh, accuracy or quality constraints, but by being free to go more aggressive, of course, achieve more savings. So I think it's, as I, as I say at the beginning, uh, um, it's it's an, a very open question. I do not have an answer yet. And this is something actually I'm, I'm looking at because I think is it's important to have it um, in order as, as everything in, in, in the site space exploration to, to reduce the time that we need to spend and then to have a, a better knowledge of what we are doing and, and then look at these possibilities of going more aggressive into approximations by knowing that we can compensate uh, other uh, errors produced by, by different layers. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have, uh, we have time for one more question from the audience, uh, Professor uh, Sergio Bunt. He thanks uh, for your talk and uh, the question is based on the leg up high level synthesis software uh, and its first generations uh, were heavily bi uh, biased towards FPGA implementations. And his question is, how did you direct uh, the leg up explorations with pragmas for the data flow architectures in which you exercise DSA? Thank you very much for the question, Professor Bumpy, and greetings from Costa Rica. Uh, well, it, yes, actually, the, the LEGAP tool is meant more for, um, for FPGA in, in that sense. Um, and actually, the, the number of, uh, so to say, of, of pragmas that they support, we were not, uh, so to say, touching those pragmas. And actually, it's part of what we did. Uh, for instance, we were not reusing uh, functional units. Uh, by reusing functional units, you got to take in, in, into consideration with more... Um, yeah, with, with more care, so to say, the ever propagation and so on, because you will be reusing components. And, and of course, this limits also the, not only the, the, the savings that you can achieve, depending on the approximations that you apply, but also the error that you will be producing. In our case, uh, even though we were hacking the leg up tool, meant more for, um, for an FPGA flow, we were looking at the, uh, at the ASIC flow because we were using this type of approximate components that have been reported in the, in the, in the literature more for this type of, of implementations. Th because this is also a challenge we saw at the beginning where we were exploring that most of the components that have been, and the approximate ones in this case, adders and multipliers that have been proposed in the, in the community when you sort of say do the FPGA flow, you don't really get the savings uh, in, in the same proportion that you can get uh, in comparison to an ASIC flow. And this is why in recent years, probably in the last two or three years, there are some uh, research group that have been proposing a specific approximate adders, a specific approximate multipliers that can be implemented into an FPGA, and then they can produce like, like really the savings that you expect in the FPGA by achieving the same uh, sort of say accuracy degradation that the counterparts uh, for, for the ASIC flow. Um, so this is something I haven't looked yet at, but it's something that is also interesting to look if the methodologies and the, the proposal that we have uh, into the leg up tool 
we can use it for but for these components that have been designed specifically for FPGA to take advantage uh, of the savings that can be achieved of, of the FPGA because of, of this mapping process, right? Um, but in our case and the results that we that we reported in, in our ICAT paper last year um, are meant, so to say, for an ASIC flow. So we keep the utilization of the tool, but once we were, uh, so to say, targeting our, our system was was more into an ASIC rather than or, or thinking into an ASIC flow rather than to the FPGA because of these limitations that we first experienced and then later on by looking at the uh, at the literature we saw that that other groups were proposing uh, components as specific for for FPGA platforms. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Casagrudinis. I would like to thank you again for this excellent talk and uh, excellent uh, topic about approximate computing. Uh, so before I close the this uh, session, uh, I would like to inform you have a, a short break, about four minutes to start the next section. And it was a pleasure to me to uh, coordinate this section with Prof Professor Castro Godinis. See you. <laughs>